In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Shine in our hearts, so Master who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the proclamations of your gospel. Instill in adults our reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having trampled down all our desires, you may lead a spiritual life while thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, for the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory together with your Father, who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life great spirit, now and ever and until we ages of ages. Amen. Please remain standing. Um, <clears throat> this is the anniversary of the niece's mother uh, passing, uh, Martha. So we're going to intone um, many years, uh, excuse me, memory eternal. Grant, O oh Lord, of Grant rest eternal and blessed repose, O Lord, to the departed servant of God, Martha, and make her memory to be eternal. May her Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'm in. Thank you. Choir practice is next Wednesday. All right, uh, we're going to continue with our discussion of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Last week we just did the uh, introduction, and uh, today we're going to continue with uh, chapter one on page one six two four. So I hopefully, if does anybody need a pencil or pen? One, anybody else? Yeah, pass those down if you would. Down into markers, I think, at this point. Down to markers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. see, see what you can find. There's most of them are markers or crayon at the moment. We'll have to, I'll, I'll try and bring, remember my school and I quite a few at home. Okay, let's read uh, verses one, one to five. Thank you. I went to one. Uh, Alan, if you would start there, uh, chapter one, verses one to five. You mean I miss all this time and I come back and I'm at chapter one, verse one? And you're at chapter <laughs> We knew you were coming back, so he's, we started giving you a new Lease on life. Well, thank, thank you. You're well, welcome. I missed you all, and uh, I just had set everything up in my tax life to be here on Mondays, and so I apologize. I couldn't switch. When we switched, yeah. yeah. So oh, thank you. Well, next year, now, hopefully, we'll be on Tuesday next, <laughs> next year. That's <laughs> right. Go ahead. Yeah. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God and the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Okay, let's go to the question and answer now, 1A. St. Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians to encourage them to continue to live their lives, worthy. what? Worthy. worthy, worthy, W-O-R-T-H-Y, worthy of God's calling, number one, to remain steadfast in their faith, faith and three, to be prepared for Christ's second coming. Okay. We're going to get into more discussion about that later on. But for right now, those are the three main things that we're looking at. Okay, the first bullet. Normally, St. Paul begins his letter with a title. For example, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But he does not do so in this letter. What do you think that means? There's no perfect answer, so don't worry about it. There wants to be more 
personal, I guess. Okay, number one, he wants to be personal. In order, and, and the reason he wants to be personal, why would you think that? Because they already know where he was coming from. Exactly. He already has a relationship with them. He already had a relationship with them, and he wants to be personal. Normally, he would give the title here, but he doesn't, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? And friendly. and friendly. Yes, exactly. In other words, he's addressing them as brothers and sisters in Christ. He's saying, we know each other already. Let's be honest and be for forthright, okay? The second bullet. What is the importance of Paul including the names of Sylvanus? The fuller form is used uh, as Silas and Timothy in the opening. Why do you think he included them? Normally, he would just say, from um, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to the Galatians, Colossians, whomever. Why does they include them? Give them authority. He, uh, they were they were helping him in his mission. They were helping him in his mission. Alan, just to uh, relay authority to them. Okay. And do the Thessalonians Thessalonians know them? Yes. 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 There's already a relationship. All right. There's already a relationship between Paul. Silas, and also Timothy and the Thessalonians. We'll get into that. Paul liked working with a what whenever possible? A team. He was a team player. Most people would not think of that because they think of him as being the uh, missionary par excellence. He's the perfect missionary, but he relied on Mark, Luke, uh, Timothy, uh, uh, Silas here, etc. Whenever possible, why would that be important to Paul? Did he need them? No. Why not? On one hand, he did not. Why? He could carry out the mission himself. He could carry it. He was very well versed. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He had all the background. Josh? Maybe like, I think like Timothy and like how. Um, like with a team, you can have different people that can relate to other people. Yeah. In other words, on the one hand, he didn't need them in the sense that he had the authority and he had the knowledge. On the other hand, all of us could use help. Why? Because we have gifts, but not all the gifts. Everybody has something to offer. And you, let's say one of us, uh, Troy is going to relate differently to people than Mike, different than Mary, different than Ekaterina. The point is, the more people you have, the more people that you could minister to and relate to, okay? Now, Sylvanus or Silas was a long and experienced companion of Paul. He traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey and was in prison and set free with Paul in the Philippian jail, Acts 16. When Paul first came to Thessalonica, Silas came with him. Therefore, the Thessalonians knew Sylvanus or Silas well. All right. Next one. Timothy was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother. He accompanied Paul on many of his missionary journeys. Paul sent Timothy to the Thessalonians on a previous occasion. So you see their involvement with the church there at Thessalonica. Two big benefits. Greek to explain to the Greeks. And Jewish from the Now, let's, let's pick up on that, door. That's a good point. It says here, uh, Timothy came from a Greek father and a Jewish mother. Generally speaking, if you have that situation, are you going to have the mother and the father equal in terms of saying, we're going to raise him in the Jewish faith or the uh, Orthodox or Christian faith? Or is one parent going to be stronger than the other? Generally. Yeah, that's usually always comes through the mother. You Judaism always usually always comes through the mother, and in this case, you would think he would have been Jewish. Any religion usually comes through the mother. I think the mother is yeah. more important <laughs> than the religion. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Your first name, Angie. Go ahead. Like, are the leaders of the spiritual? Yes, the father and would generally be the head of the house. And spiritually? And spiritually, yes. But that's not always the case. In, in reality, what may be written in scripture and what happens in reality, what I have seen is generally speaking, and I'm talking about the counseling I've done well, in the Air Force and so forth with a couple from all different backgrounds. One is going to be stronger than the other, generally speaking. And especially if they don't have an idea of the relationship in the marriage. If it's going to be 
we're, a lot of people come and say what? We want this to be equal. Mm -hmm. That's the word that you usually hear. Instead of saying, all right, what are your gifts? What do you bring to the marriage? What do you bring to the marriage? What's your role as a husband? What's your role as the wife? We always compare it to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, as we've mentioned many times. Who is the bridegroom in the, in the, in the scheme of things? Christ. Christ. Who's the bride? The church. And so what does the bridegroom do for the church? He dies on the cross. Mm -hmm. What does the bride do for the bridegroom? Be obedient and follow them. So you always use that relationship of the church and Christ and in terms of that. But let's be honest. In our society today, we're lucky to get people who are Christian, let alone what's the role yet. So whenever what I see, my first assignment in Denver, I'll never forget, there was a Serbian Orthodox woman with a Jewish husband. Now, officially, that should not be. In other words, they would have had difficulty getting married in the church. But sometimes due to the economy in Greek, what we call it for the salvation of the people, now you do what's best and what, what we can. So this, this couple was married and he was going blind. Mm -hmm. He was going blind. And what happened, I'll never forget, is we blessed their home. He was, And the good thing was she was the stronger in the faith. So he would follow her. Now, he sat through the whole service and interacted very little. But I always say, you know, it was like uh, uh, this past week when I gave the sermon on uh, St. John Climacus, where he had that uh, miracle where he had an individual uh, who uh, was uh, tilling the ground for him. Uh, Climacus fell asleep, as did the, uh, the man who was tilling the ground. And then what happens is uh, uh, an angel comes basically to... Uh, Climacus, and he says to him, why are you sleeping here? Your uh, friend is in danger. And what happens is, immediately, St. John Climacus gets up and starts praying for this uh, uh, individual. And then the individual comes home at night, and Climacus asks him, basically, did anything happen today to you? Anything remarkable? He said, no, not really, except this one thing, where I was sleeping, and something aroused me at that time, and I got up, startled, and I saw you there, and then I went and ran. And then right after that, a huge boulder came down and crushed the part where I was sleeping. Okay. So what we say about that is the mm -hmm. prayers of the righteous avail it much. In other words, you should always pray for somebody. You never know what is happening. If you are aroused in nighttime and you get up and something and you feel something in your heart, the first thing you do is pray. Even if you don't know for what or what, uh, for whom. Just get up and say a prayer. There's nothing else than Jesus' prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or anything like that that you could uh, use. Because you never know, and that's why I go back to this. What's going to happen to that you know, couple? You know, are they still alive that we met in Denver? That I don't know. I, but, I, but I look back at it. I give the woman, the wife, credit for bringing up the kids in the Christian faith. And I give him credit for going along with it. So, you know, I always say, we'll leave God to be the judge, Christ to be the judge, and thank God for Christ being the judge. But always pray for anybody, because we all could use it. All right, all right let's go on here. By describing the church of the Thessalonians as being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul gives their Christian life a what kind of focus or flavor? Eschatology. Eschatological. E S C. H A T O L O G I C A L. All right. We're going to talk a little more about this later on because they're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. Their life on earth is not lived just in Macedonia. Oh, I don't know what I need this. Yeah. <laughs> a fraud. A fraud. <laughs> okay. The go oh, here. You know what happened? I added that after I ran out this uh, my own copy, so I apologize. All right. The Greek word eschaton means what? Last things. Yes. Well, uh, last or last uh, last things. Their life on earth. Is not lived just in Macedonia. It is lived in God and the Lord Jesus in where? Heaven. In heaven. In heaven. 
Okay. No, I'm good. All right, the next one, C. In verse 2, when Paul thought of the Christians in Thessalonica, his heart was filled with what? Gratitude. Gratitude. Oh, Gratitude. He was thankful. He was grateful. He started the church there, but was run out of town after only how many weekends? Three. Three. Now, can you imagine that? You go and you start a church on the third weekend. You're out of here. You know, talk about. Now, what's more amazing about that, though? How it grew. How it grew? He must have been powerful in preaching, and the people must have responded very well to be kicked out after three weekends, and yet the church is going back there now, and they're telling him later on, we'll hear about this, that it's flourishing in its own way. So it's here again, you, you, going back to that first question we talked about where, with Martina there, Paul had it together. He was knowledgeable, he was influential. He uh, could win people over, and when he spoke, people listened, okay? Now, it says here, yet the church was strong and full of what? Yeah. what? To whom do you think Paul attributed this? Uh, In particular, which one of the Holy Trinity? Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Anything we do is guided always by the Holy Spirit. The, all three work together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they all have a role. But generally speaking, when we look at the, the gift of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we look at everything that happens, and they'll talk about this more later, it is always guided by the Holy Spirit. How often does Paul, Timothy, and Savannah pray and uh, mention them uh, in, in their prayers? Always. It says here, always, always. In verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you. Now, what does that mean for us who pray for other people? How should we pray? How often? Always. Always. Now, okay, let's break that down. If you have a prayer list, generally speaking, for whom do you put at the top of the list? Family. Family, generally. Generally, be family or who else? I'm sorry? Most the person most in need, friend, priest, priest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> no, that that would be the clergy. You know, the leaders of the of the uh, parish or whatever. Now, let's say somebody comes to you and says, "I'm going to have a heart operation," and uh, and so forth. And you pray for them. The heart operation goes well. You keep praying for them, or do you take them off the list? Keep praying. Keep praying. Why? Keep time until they recover completely. And if it takes six months or a year, you put them on your list and you continue every day. Okay. And that's the point. In other words, they will let you know when. Yes. And it's all right. In, now, if you're close to them, you keep them on. All right. But if it's somebody who, like I gave tonight, a Mary, I got a call this morning from our friends uh, up in Pennsylvania. There's a man going into serious heart operation this week. So um, our friends asked, us to pray for them because his he and his wife listened to Father Stavros on the uh, daily prayer uh, meditation that goes down. So I've asked her to put him on the prayer list. His name is Henry, if you wanted to ask him. And then what happens is you pray for that person for that period of time. Now, over a period of time, what you could do is, um, it, it, like for us, especially in the military, we have a lot of bases. We have 10 bases. We a lot learned uh, got to know a lot of people in civilian parishes as well as the military, and so I have a list, a detailed list of especially those who have passed away. I have one for the living, one for the dead. They're small type where a lot of people. And once a month, I can go through that whole list, at least once a month. Then the others I have for my regular Sunday list and daily list. So I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm saying to you, make sure you pray. And when Paul says pray constantly or be in prayer always, it doesn't mean you have to get the book out and go through everything. It means to put your mind in the presence mm -hmm. of the Lord, especially when you have time like driving, not when you're in a classroom, let's say, per se, or whatever, but when you're driving, when you have free time, when you have this or that. Keep your mind, you know, say the, the Jesus prayer, use another prayer, use a psalm, whatever you want to do. 
But I think it's very important here when Paul said, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Now, did he go through a list with each person individually? We don't know. He could have prayed for all the saints at, at uh, Thessalonica. So, hey, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on there. Uh, the, the footnote, if you would, uh, Martina, if you would read there on bottom page 1624, just for uh, one, two. Give thanks in the New Testament Greek is Eucharisto, from which we get our English word Eucharist. A spirit of thanksgiving constantly pervades the prayers of Paul. It's here when he specifically remembers the cry the Christians in Thessaloniki. Okay, so um, when we think about the Eucharist, it's very you know we say how to start to say thank you, you know, and so forth. But you think of it as, a, again, the English word for Eucharist, and that's where we get that for our communion on Sunday. All right? Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the next page, uh, D. Paul remembers them for their work of what? Faith. Faith. Their labor of love and patience of hope. Notice the words. Faith, hope, love. All right, we're going to see these time and again. The word toil in Greek, kopos, means to work to the point of exhaustion. exhaustion. Very hard. Yes. <laughs> very very uh, hard working to the point of exhaustion. All and refers to their care for one another. Not for those just in Thessalonica, but also for their what? And hospitality. Very good. Hospitality and support of all their fellow Christians in Macedonia. Remember, Paul would take a, a, a collection. <clears throat> and for which church in particular, which one was the poorest of all of the five original churches? <laughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So he was taking that. He thanked the people for what they did for them, showing that it's not. Now, what does that say about our lives today? Let's take St. John's here. We go to St. John's. What did that mean for us how would we apply to what Paul is telling them to what we should be doing here? We have the same obligation in any church that we decide to go to wherever we are to do our obligation, what it is besides the candle that we pay for. We still pay, I still yeah. pay. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, right. Now it's free. Yeah. Okay, to do your obligation. Okay, to pray for them, to attend services. And what else are we supposed to do? How do you take it out? Do we only go, do we only help the people in St. John's? No. You we should be helping where? Everyone. Everywhere. In other words, uh, I don't know if you saw it here. We were collecting now with our <clears throat> veterans ministry and first responders. We're collecting uh, bed sheets and uh, uh, towels for uh, Tampa Hope. We have some veterans there. With, most of them are not, but some veterans are there, and also they're in need of single uh, sheets, uh, sheets for single beds, and we had a real nice collection. So um, we are still collecting this Sunday and the next Sunday too. And so things like that to go out. This Saturday, we're going there to uh, help the, deliver the meal in the morning for breakfast. So uh, just keep that in mind. We're not to only to think of ourselves. It's not about just the church here and about how nice we can make the church look and all. It means about taking care of people's needs. Yeah, yeah, putting your faith into action. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Leo, would you read the good note for 1-3 on page 1624, please? Remembering and without ceasing, describe effective prayer. Faith, hope, and love are three Christian virtues all linked together and other letters. These virtues are connected to actions, faith, works, love, labors. Hope produces patience, showing that salvation goes beyond attitudes to action. I like that last sentence. Yep. Salvation goes beyond attitudes to action. What does that mean? Put your what into what? Faith. Put your faith into action. So many people we talk about, you know, saying our, we love Jesus Christ, and then we don't love our neighbor. We have to love Christ first, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit, and then love our neighbor and show that we do that in various ways. Okay, let's go on there. Um, Troy, if you would read, or oh, no, let me read first of all, four. 
no, three, uh, the second bullet there. Their patience of hope is also their what of hope? Perseverance. Perseverance. P E R S E V E R A N C E. Enduring all manner of suffering because of their hope. The blessed hope of the second coming burns brightly in their hearts and gives them the steadfast courage to endure anything. Now, this concept of patience of hope is also their perseverance of hope. What do we hope? We know we hope in Jesus Christ, okay? I'm not asking that. But what keeps us going when we go through suffering and have to endure persecution and everything else? We hope for the better. Okay. And we hope that tomorrow is going to be better than today. Okay, hope the next day, yeah. That in the end, Christ wins, and therefore we need to, like, save and help as many people in the meantime. Very good. So we know the end result. Martina? Yeah. I was also thinking that even in the suffering, we kind of hope, not kind of, but we, we know that there is a reason for that and it's right. for our salvation and God is purifying our, our soul. So we just keep our mind on that. And Exactly. So in Romans, Paul writes, suffering produces what? Endurance. Endurance, Endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces oh. hope. So in suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. So what happens there is we know the end result. Christ is coming again. If we don't keep that in mind, what can easily happen? Despair. You could get this, you could be overcome by whatever you're enduring and going through and suffering. But for, for, for Paul. Let's say he goes to the Thessalonica and gets thrown out in the dinner weekend. You know, it's like, what do I do now? No, he went back. He encouraged. In other words, you don't want to go back because you know that there's a reason for it happening and that if I go back, I'm going to try, try, try it again until I, you know, basically Paul says, I became everything to everyone in order to save some. Mm -hmm. he, tried, he tried to save everybody, but he knew he couldn't do it. So he said, I'll, be, I'll talk to you like, uh, I'll talk to Marcos do one way, to uh, Mike another way, to Jose a different way, just to win you over. So I'll become whatever you are to try and identify with you, but I have to be real. And you have to be real. You can't become the other person. You just want to know what is important to them so you can relate to them. All right? I think that's important. All right, let's go on here. Uh, e, in verse 4, Paul uses the phrase beloved or beloved by God. The Jews applied this only to great men, such as Moses and Solomon and the nation of Israel itself. Now, the greatest privilege of the greatest men of God's chosen people had been extended to the humblest of the yeah. Gentile. It goes out to all of us now, to the entire world. What does that say to us today in this world? Aaron? All of us. In other words, I don't care your status, I don't care your race, I don't care your sex, I don't care this or that, I mean, male or female. But uh, the point is, I'm open to everybody. I'm open, the gospel message is open to all, all right? All right, Troy, why don't you read then verses uh, 6 to 10, uh, beginning there on page 1624 in chapter 1. And he became followers of us and of the Lord. <clears throat> having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they, for they themselves uh, <clears throat> declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay, let's go to the question and answer there for 2a. Paul not only gives thanks for the Thessalonians' work, Torah, and steadfastness, but also that they became followers or what of the apostles and of Christ? <laughs> Imitators. Imitators. For the Thessalonians also experienced much 
Tribulation. Tribulation. Through their joyful reception of the gospel in the midst of such persecution, the Thessalonians became a what? Pattern. P-A-T-T-E-R-N. The Greek here in this section is tupos. Tupos. Meaning type, T-Y-P-E, or example. To all those who believe, not only in their own province of Macedonia, but also south of them in Achaia. With their suffering came also the what of the Holy Spirit? Joy. Joy. Here's the Holy Spirit again. The Lord's charis, charisma, charismatic or charisma, charisma gift or charismatic gift to his whom? Martyrs, M A R T Y R S, and confessors. Who are the martyrs and who are the confessors? If we look on the calendar in the Orthodox Church, you're going to find a whole list of different saints. One is listed differently, though. Martyrs and what do you think a martyr would would do? Obviously, it's worse than okay, we're hurt. A confessor. What's different about the confessor? I guess you confess to them. Confess to confess what? Your sins? No. You stood up for the faith. You stood up for faith. I confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Okay. I confess that Jesus is the Lord. I'm a believer. Today uh, is Denise's uh, name day. Nika N I K A, and there were a list of women on today's calendar. And uh, they were uh, uh, basically uh, thrown into the water and they wound up to drown. They wound up walking on the water. Later on, they were drowned. The point is, when you become a confessor, if, if it would be like um, anybody who stands before the emperor at that time, and they would say, give up your faith and come over and offer your uh, gift, incense, to me, to the emperor, and oh, by the way, worship this idol. And when you say, no, I confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord, I believe in Father, Son, and Spirit, and that's it. The one of the greatest saints of the early church, Ignatius, mm -hmm. Ignatius basically said, why would I give up? He has helped me through my entire life. Why would I give up now and condemn? And he was a martyr. So what happens is when you confess, when you confess it, now, you think that is happening today? And if so, where? Middle East. Middle East. East, East. Easy. <laughs> it could be anywhere where, especially the Christians, uh, I, again, having dealt with a lot of Coptic Orthodox in Egypt, only 10% of the uh, population is uh, Christian there, 90% Muslim. They've overrun monasteries, killed monks, bishops. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you saw it or not. There was an Assyrian Orthodox. This was on the... Uh, uh, web the other night, an Assyrian Orthodox uh, bishop in Australia who was uh, was uh, being uh, stabbed. He was stabbed several times. But came when he was at the uh, preaching and, and came up and uh, stabbed him. I think it was three or four times. And that person apparently had killed some people prior to that. In other words, we can't assume. I don't care where you go. Uh, I think you think it's going to get easier or, or more difficult or to be. I think, well, let's be honest. Ever since Christ rose, uh, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, we are one day closer to his second coming. Now, we're going to talk about because the Thessalonians were very concerned about that. And they wanted to know when is he coming and what they did as a result of that. So, okay, let's go on here. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Susie, how about reading the footnote for one to six? One six on page one six two four. Followers, literally imitators of Christ, also imitate spiritual leaders, pastors, bishops, in this case, the apostles, even in their suffering. Let others be instructed by you, at least by your duties. With their wrath, you be mild. With their boastful speech, you be humble minded. With their abuse, you offer prayers. 
with their deceit, you be firm in faith. With their cruelty, you be gentle, not evil to enmity. And that was Ignatius of Antioch who wrote that. Go ahead. The joy of the Holy Spirit is not an easy emotional high, but comes with the struggle proper to spiritual life, including persevering through affliction. The one who suffers is the one who is comfortable. Would you agree with that last line? The one who suffers is the one who is comfortable. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You can't get comfort if you're not suffering. <clears throat> Good point. Would you ever know what it's like to experience true peace if you do not go through suffering? Mm -hmm. No. Now, that's important. Because most people, if you have a choice, most people are going to what would suffer? They'll run away from it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go out of here tonight and throw yourself in front of a car or something so I can visit you tomorrow. No, I've talked to you about the fact that if you go through tribulation, and those of you who grew up with not the best of a home environment, let's start there. Most people could identify with certain things that they grew up with. Or maybe you grew up where it wasn't that bad, but then you went to work or you went to college or went to wherever, and then you found another challenge there. Or maybe you had a sickness uh, from when you were younger, any kind. And until you go through that suffering, it's going to be difficult. Now, uh, you heard Father Sauber's talk this Sunday where he was giving a retreat uh, up in New Jersey last weekend, and the priest was just reassigned, and uh, there was a terrible accident with uh, a busload of uh, children who were special needs. And the one that uh, was in the parish of this Greek Orthodox priest was burned uh, there, uh, unfortunately, and died. Uh, I went online to look at it. Uh, it's very interesting to see the family. And they had talked, not, uh, it wasn't after the accident, this was way before. She was the oldest of about three or four children. And she was um, had special needs. And she would, had a, uh, a strong influence on a lot of people. Now, the question I would have here is, this family, put yourself in their position, the husband and wife. The child didn't do anything. I don't know what happened with the tractor trailer that hit it or the driver or anything like that. Do you think, how do you think they're going to, what, what's the first thing they're going to experience as they go through the, the grief process? Pain. I'm sorry? Denial. Pain. Pain. Denial, maybe, oh, this can't be true. Yeah. And, and uh, at whom? God. It could be God first. Most people would probably go and say, what would they say to God? Why? Why, Why did you allow this? Yeah. Are they going to get an answer to that? No. Maybe. maybe not. No. I would probably. only say no. Why? You're probably not going to get an answer. <laughs> and that's one thing I would ask. Uh, Michael met with us before. Uh, and did you want to share that, uh, that little bit? No, okay. I don't want to be on the spot. Uh, he, he and his family have gone through a lot, but I would say this. He has a sister who's battling some things right now and uh, never asked why. And she's been going to uh, uh, dialysis for at least eight years, eight, eight years. And every morning she gets up, five o'clock, goes to the dialysis at five to nine and goes to church. And she volunteers to go and help the people who are being paid there <laughs> as she's volunteering all this. And she just does it. She's always giving, helping with the Girl Scouts, all this stuff. The point is, you have to make a decision when you go through suffering. Is this going to overtake me or am I going to find consolation in Christ? Is that easy to reconcile? Usually not. Usually you go through it. You talk about pain, anger, questioning, um, denial. And then you go almost to the stages of Google Ross, you know, to eventually get to the point of acceptance. I can't change this. And who's always still in charge? So we will never understand why, but we can accept the fact that he did not want it, but he allowed it. Marco, isn't this sad? That so many people are suffering out there. Yeah. I do not have Christ. Mm -hmm. And they have no comfort whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's because yeah. it says the one who suffers, I've got a Bible right here, uh -huh. is oh, the one who is comforted. And that 
when the focus is person suffers, but without Christ, we have no hope whatsoever. Yeah. And the, and the point is what you just mentioned there is you have to go through the suffering to get to where uh, you can be have that peace. So that's how much we need. Yeah, of course. And that and that's the key to it. Okay, read, uh, since you have it there open, Marcos, why don't you read 1 Peter, oh, never mind. Let's turn to page 1688. 1688. It's in 1 Peter? Yeah, 1 Peter, uh, chapter Four, four. four verses 12 and 13. 1688, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Uh, to 16, I think. Oh, 16. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. And the footnote for the bottom. Yeah. Okay, Marcos, go ahead. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to no, 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 no. Prepare for the end of suffering by suffering. First Peter, what verse? Uh, chapter 4, verse 12. 4, 12. 4, 12. Four, 12. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. 12 to 6, please. This section is prepare for the end of suffering. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to you as though try you. Try you. Try you. Trial, which is to try you. Yeah, I'm yeah. not the word. As though some strange. Thing is happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for, for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of God and of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blessed them, but on your part, he is glorified. But that none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For in this the end, what it says basically is, if Christ suffered, why should we not? Mm -hmm. if, so when anybody says to you, you know, why should you suffer? Well, if you call yourself a Christian and you believe in him and follow him and want to emulate him, he was perfect and died on the cross. We're not. Why should we not suffer? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay, and then uh, Marcos said, no, read the uh, footnote for 412 to 13 on the bottom of the page if you can get to that. Yeah. The fiery trial is the beginning, is, is the suffering of tribulations that tempt us to faithfulness, unfaithfulness to the ruin of our faith. God's people have always suffered unjustly, but in baptism, the sufferings is which we partake, in which we partake are those of Christ himself, which will ultimately bring great joy. When will we experience the joy? When we're reunited with him. When we're united with him. You may not be too joyful here on earth, <laughs> unless it's through the Holy Spirit, but to, when I say joyful... What when you think of somebody joyful, what kind of expression do you expect to see on their face? Smile, Smile what else? If they feel like they're really joyful, what would they be doing with their hands or yes. <laughs> you know <laughs> think of people at a stadium after a uh, touchdown for the Bucks or something like that. The what happens is this. Does that always have to be joy? How else can you that person experience joy? Crying. Crying. And why it, Why would you say that? Because you're just so overwhelmed. It's like so emotional. You can't. I just. So they could be tears. If people it's saw you, they would probably think negatively. But what you're saying, there are tears of joy. That's number one. What's the other way that you could experience? Where would you experience it? Not out here, but in, you know, heart, in your heart. In your heart. In your heart. When you have that joy, you don't have to be like this. You could be very peaceful and just people would see you and not know the difference. And yet you're bursting at the strength. That Sunday, so. Last Sunday when you were with me, <laughs> I could tell with your face. I mean, you were giving it away. <laughs> so, he was going. That's a good, good, good way of putting it. So what happens is the joy of Christ comes in and you can experience that inside. Inside. And you don't have to be outward. Okay, let's go back now. Uh, so it's 1624. 
1624, and we're going to look at the footnote for 110 there, uh, Caterini, when we get there on 1620. 1 to 10, is that what I got? Yes. Yeah, 110, 110. The early Christians expected Christ to return in the lifetime. This hope helped purge the lives of sin. Now, that's interesting. What are the last, what's one of the last words in the Bible in the book of Revelation, right near the end of the uh, reading? It's one word. Mar Maranatha. Maranatha. What does that mean? Oh. Come, Lord Jesus. They thought he was coming immediately. They thought he was coming immediately. All right? And so what happens here, the early Christians expected Christ to return in their lifetime. In their lifetime. Now, there's a gospel lesson that we read in the Orthodox <clears throat> once every uh, 11 weeks. And it talks about Peter and John going with Christ. And in the conversation, there is, I'm paraphrasing here, basically it says that um, John could live beyond for a long time. And Peter says, well, how could that be? And I, I, I'm doing, not doing justice to this. But basically, he says, it's not your business. He didn't say that he would live forever. He just said, it'll be determined by me on how long this will be. Don't worry about it. And so, Alan, do you want to say something? So what happens here is um, with us today, <clears throat> would you say that people think Christ is coming soon? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why would you say that? Because of everything that's happening in the world with the um, nature and the movements with the children and all that. And the, uh, the political situation, yeah. violence. Well, he's been coming soon since he left. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> soon. There's, there's soon and then there's soon. <laughs> okay, so what we have is here that last sentence, though. This hope helped purge their lives of sin. Do you think that's happening today? Mm -hmm. no. Probably no. not for most people. <laughs> it says here, the early Christians expected Christ to return in their lifetime. This hope helped purge their lives of sin. In other words, they were afraid he's coming. I better get my life in order, repent, confess my sins. So is that happening today? Not with what we see. Not with what we see. Like All right. the days of Noah. Yeah, in, in what way? Like, like, like back, you know, back then they didn't believe Noah. They just uh, blew him off yeah. and, until it was too late. Until it was too late. So, and we're going to get into uh, uh, this whole concept of Christ's second coming. The Orthodox takes a different, the early church, you want to, and we don't uh, predict anything there. But we'll talk a little more about it as we talk about what the Thessalonians did in that situation. Okay, let's go on now. Um, we're going down to B. The use of the single name Jesus in verse 10. Let me read that. It says here, uh, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, uh, is significant because it refers to the earthly what of the Lord? Humility. humility. His earthly humility. St. Paul contrasts the earthly humility of Jesus with his coming in heavenly glory. Two different things. Humility and then total glory. When the Lord appeared in human history, he came as Jesus, the humble carpenter of Nazareth. In this humility, he was persecuted to death, even as the Thessalonians were being persecuted. Yet the same Jesus will come in glory. Thus the glory of the coming of the Lord is the pledge, P-L-E-D-G-E, -E, or the Thessalonians of their own glory. It's a pledge to them that they're going to experience the same thing. God has glorified the persecuted Jesus and will glorify them also. Now, to wait for the Lord means to wait with what? Patience. Patience and what kind of expectancy? Confident. 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 It means to keep on waiting. It doesn't just mean wait. It means keep on. Keep struggling. Keep enduring. Keep doing what you're doing and prepare yourself. Keep praying. 
Keep worshiping him. Keep reading the scriptures. Don't wait and say, all right, he's coming. I'm going to take a rest. And that's what they did. Father, in yeah. spite of all things that happened bad, and today I'm, I'd like to say briefly that there are so many false prophets out there coming oh, yeah. on the internet all the time and trying to yeah. sell this. We need somebody called me up recently and really worried about one of these. I said, turn it off. Yeah, turn it off. The best thing to do is if you're reading something and you don't believe it or really turn it off, don't be influenced about them. You know, because then it's almost like uh, I call it these spam emails and all that. Uh, you know, don't turn open them. Okay, now in verse 10, it says, He raised from the dead of Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath? Well, oh, no, wait, let's go up to the bullet before. I'm sorry. Yes. Why do Christians look forward to Christ's second coming? <laughs> we hope to be on the sheep. I'm sorry? We hope to be on the side of the We hope to be on the right hand. All right. We're going to be on the right hand of the God of the Father. Yes. Andrew? If it weren't for Christ coming judgment, I would go crazy. Interesting. Paisio. Say Paisio. If it weren't for Christ coming, I would go crazy. crazy. In other words, yeah. In other, why would he say that? What, what does he mean by that? You would have nothing to what? Hopeful. We have nothing to hope for. Yeah. 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 Is there a heaven and hell? Yeah. yeah. That's what gives us the hope is that we will be accountable as all people. All right. And so the most the important thing we should ask for on judgment day is one word what? Mercy. Mercy. Over and over, Lord of mercy, 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 okay? And so what happens is we look forward to Christ. What will happen to suffering? God, what happens to sickness? God, what happens to death? God. That's what we're looking forward to. And oh, by the way, what will we be like? Thankful. Thankful. And <laughs> what type of person? Glorified. Glorified. We'll Transformed. We will take on a totally different freedom. Free. Body. Freedom. It's a transformed, glorified uni unification of both body with soul. So the body, that's what becomes important. The body and soul are reunited. Will we still be able to recognize people? Yeah. 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 We will know there's a family. We we will look forward to that. Anyone who's lost a relative, a close friend, or anybody like that, you look forward to being reunited in heaven with them. And it, it, the prayer that we read for the dead after uh, at the memorial services, where there is neither sickness, nor sorrow, nor sign, but life everlasting, eternal life, and that's what we look forward to. Is Sorry, they recognize each other now. Yeah, I think they will. They have a foretaste. That's one. Yeah, all that we say about that, we don't say what nobody's come back to say. We say they get a foretaste of what it's going to be like when they're judged on the set at the second coming. So we have an individual judgment when we first die. We get a foretaste of where we're going to be. But on the last day when Christ comes, then he'll separate those the right from the left, sheep from the goat. Okay. Um no, they have a I would I'm sorry, go ahead. I thought I heard somebody on Zoom. All right. Why would one fear his second come? I definitely feel like I fear it a lot more than I want him to come, but then I'm like, oh, I'm not ready. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, he could say, like, I never knew you, even though. Well, I, I, okay, you, you bring up a good spirit, spiritual, uh, scriptural point there. Mm -hmm. All right, remember this scriptural point where he says people perform miracles, they did a lot of good things, etc. Mm -hmm. But when they get there, he'll say, I'm sorry, I did not know you. Mm -hmm. What was their sin? They did with their own glory I'm sorry? Religion. Like they, they didn't have a personal relationship. Religion yeah, just have a, yeah. And, and go ahead. Uh, and and they made it for their own glory, not exactly. their glory of us. They didn't have the personal relationship with Christ, but they went through the motions of doing good things. What does that say about people who do good but are not committed to Christ? Empty work. Yeah, it could be empty work. In other words, I wouldn't want to be in that position. And we know a lot of people who, they're good people, who would, you know, help people and so forth. But in other words, what he says is you can be performing miracles, but you know what? The devil can even do that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really be careful. And so what you want to do is make sure 
he it still goes back to what he asked Peter. Who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so we have to say, I am committed to Christ, but then we have to put that into action. So both of you are writing that. If you don't have the personal relationship, you can go to church all you want, go through all the motions, serve all the coffee you want, and so forth. <laughs> and all this, but... <laughs> she does more than I'll ever do. So what happens with all of that... Um, if we don't have that relationship and we're doing for the wrong reason, cry. That goes back to Cain and Abel. Saying you were mentioning my bit earlier. Okay. In verse 10, what does the wrath to come mean in verse 10? What's it going to be like when Jesus comes again? Judgment. Yeah. Chaos. Bad. <laughs> bad. There's going to be bad times. All right. We're not going to go into this in depth because we'd have to go into the book of Revelation. And uh, here again, we, we all I would say is if, if, if like maybe it goes back to what you said, Martin, I'm looking forward to Jesus Christ coming, but I hope it's not near the end when all this stuff happens. I hope he takes me before that. But here again. <laughs> Okay, let's read. Uh, we're just going to, maybe we should stop here. Yeah, let, we'll wait for it. Start chapter two the next time um, as we go on. Okay, anybody on Zoom, do you have any uh, comments or any questions that, uh, before we leave? Thank you for participating. And uh, let's stand. We'll finish with this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord, our God, that again on this occasion, you have opened our eyes to the light of your wisdom. You have gladdened our hearts with the knowledge of truth. We entreat you, Lord, help us always to do your will. Bless our souls and bodies, our words and deeds. Enable us to grow in grace, virtue, and good habits, that your name may be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. We take care of you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.